subject is church growth, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. I want to encourage you to use the outline that's in front of you and sitting in the pew there, and as we begin tonight, I want to have you have your Bibles ready at Ephesians chapter 4, so please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to spend a great deal of our time in uh, certain verses there in that fourth chapter that address the issue of growth, growth as individuals and growth as the body of Christ, the church. And so um, I want to start uh, tonight uh, with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into the class. So let's go ahead and take time to talk to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this wonderful, wonderful day, Father. Thankful for the blessings that you showered upon us. We are uh, so blessed with many things, Father. We are your spoiled children. Here we are tonight looking to each other as brothers and sisters, addressing you as our Father, and it's just a great privilege to be here. We enjoy the fellowship. We enjoy time that we can spend in your word, Father. We pray for those that were not able to make it tonight. We pray for those that will be able to watch this as it's being recorded later on on YouTube that will watch this lesson. And we just want to glorify you. We want to lift up your name, and we, we want to do that on earth. It's through your body, the body of Jesus Christ, the church, that we can glorify you and uh, give you the praise and, and help you uh, help uh, others to see, Father, how awesome you are. So bless us in the class tonight. Continue to guide us in all that we do. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So let's talk about church growth. Um, what comes to your mind when you hear the, the two words church growth? Kind of make this a little discussion tonight. What do you think of church growth? What does that mean to you? Numbers. In numbers? Head count. Evangelism. Evangelism. Who said that, Brian? Yeah. All right. He's right down my alley there. But it's not all about evangelism, but that's a major aspect of it. I was say, what do you mean by what do you mean by church? Ah. That's, that's the thing. What are we talking about? Yeah. Are we talking about congregational growth? Are we talking about the kingdom? No, I said, what do you what do we and the answer is yes, <laughs> to both of those, yes. That's right. So let's kind of narrow it down. And what we're going to do tonight to help us narrow it down, you'll see on your outline, the title of the lesson today is The Goal of Growth. What are we trying to accomplish? Why do we want to grow? And what does growth mean? We're going to be uh, looking, you'll see three major uh, points on the outline there. We're going to be talking about uh, what is growth. We need to define that. And he's kind of addressed that already by talking about what, you know, what church, church, when you talk about church growth, well, what is growth? We'll talk about that, how it relates to the church. And then secondly, we're going to talk about what are the evidences of growth? What is it that we see that says, ah, oh, there's growth taking place? What are the evidences? And then the third question will be, uh, what are the elements that God uses to grow his church today? And there are, I think, four of them on your outline there. So let's consider these together tonight. I, I really, church growth is a very hot topic among the religious circles today, uh, and uh, it is certainly talked about. There are lots of books written on it, classes, seminars, about how we grow the church today. And uh, there's a, a lot of different points of em emphasis on this. You know, what, what are we emphasizing? And somebody threw out the word numbers. That was the first thing. I was surprised when he said numbers. When I said church growth, I think Gary said numbers. And certainly, that is a part of it, but really, that's my, maybe kind of a minor point of emphasis in my mind as far as numbers, because what we're talking about is, when we talk about church growth, we're not talking about filling the pews with people, we're talking about filling the people with God. You see the difference? Let me say it again. It's not about filling the pews with people, it's about filling people with God. And when we fill people with God, we got the priority straight, first of all. When people are filled with God, quite naturally that's going to mean that the pews will probably fill up as well. So let's make sure we don't put the cart before the horse. All right, what is the goal of growth? Uh, let me throw that question at you. But now looking at the outline, don't cheat now. What is the goal of growth? What are we after? What are we trying to accomplish, Brian? People are Jesus. Yeah, but you said it a while ago, too. Oh, okay. but, yeah, yeah, that's true, too. Evangelism. That's not a goal. That's not a goal. That's a means. That's right not a job. That's not the goal. Evangelism is not the goal. Okay, so then what's the goal if it's not getting people to heaven? That's well, evangelism, evangelism is not the same as getting people to heaven. I, I see we've got to hang up on a, yeah, a yeah, theological yeah. word there, well, evangelism. Evangelism is, a evangelism is method, saving so. people so they can go to heaven. And so if... if, if Growing the church, if the goal is not so we can get people to heaven, well, then what is the goal? Yeah, I think we're here. I 
for mixing things. Okay. But yeah, I mean, when you say the goal, right? I mean, to yeah, she can save the loss. That's yeah. a, that's a goal, right? I mean, so, but how do we how do we measure that? How do we quantify? How do we know we're doing that? So there's got to be some quantifiable aspect to it. You know so I mean? there's numerical so. growth, and then there is maturity growth in individuals. Sure. And those go hand in hand. Ultimately, the bottom line is, I mean, Jesus, what was his mission on earth? Luke chapter 19, verse 10, to seek and save the lost. It's about saving people, getting them to heaven. And we want our church to grow so that we can get people into the kingdom here on earth and then the kingdom in heaven when this short life is done. We want to get people to heaven. So there's corporate growth, there's individual growth. But the growth is really about the salvation of souls, and uh, it is also about individuals before we get to talking about the group. And when there is growth in individuals, there will be growth then in the body as a whole. And if you're not totally seeing that yet, let's read a couple verses here in Ephesians chapter 4. hope you're open there. I'm reading from the New King James Version. In Ephesians chapter 4... Let's start, right, we're going to read starting at verse 11 in a minute, but I want to now go down to verses 15 and 16 to kind of get the end of it first, and we'll come back and get it later. But in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 15, it says, that we're speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So what is Christ the head of? We're going to read verse 16 in a minute. He's the head of the church. We want to grow up into our head, grow into maturity, speak the truth so we can get into our head, and then that's going to cause, we're going to see in verse 16, the growth of the body. So then he goes on to say in verse 16, he says, From then, that's the head, from whom the whole body, that's the church, join and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working, that's a key word in our text, working, by which every part then does its share, and that causes what? There's our key word. Causes growth, growth of what? The same. It's body. Verse 16, growth of the body. There's our idea. That's where we get church growth from. The church is the body, growth of the body. We're trying to grow the body, and at the end of verse 16 it says, we're doing this, and we're what? We edifying each other, edifying itself, which is the church, Edifying the church in love. So there's a lot of things going on here. We're trying to work together. There's a working going on. And there is an effective working, which every part's doing its share. It's causing the growth of the body. We're edifying each other, and we're edifying each other in the love. What kind of love? The love of God. All right. Well, there's several things I'm throwing at you, but let's put it all together now. So today, look at, you know, turn on your TV and watch some of these popular preachers, and one of the things that they'll do with these mega churches is while he's preaching, they'll not only show you, only show you this amazing, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, platform, or uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking for is stage. stage, that's what I want, stage, like it's a performance, right? And then they'll, they'll as they're watching, you're seeing this big, humongous stage, and it's elaborate, and got all these technical things, and then they pan out and look at the audience, and what you see on TV is you see every seat full, and you see lots of seats. And this marketing aspect of the church seeks into this secular uh, a a attitude toward it, seeks into how we do church today, and we think, ah, some people think, there's church growth. You see uh, big churches, numbers, you see programs that they have, you see ministries that they have, you see strategies that they have for growth, you see gimmicks that they're using to draw people in. Gimmicks, you know, whatever, uh, you know, free this or free that or program the Starbucks, you know, uh, coffee shop inside the church, but whatever it is, all these things to draw people in, to get more numbers in. Hopefully, and I'm not trying to speak negatively to all this, but hopefully the bottom line is, again, they're not just filling the pews with people, they're filling people with God. That's really what we want to happen. So, let's talk about growth. What is growth? That's your first point on your outline, the ex explanation of growth. What is growth? Well, what, do you, what is it to you? What is growth? What does it look like? What is growth? 
and we grow a lot of things. We grow food, we grow families, we grow grass, we grow... Let's talk about, let's talk about physical, physical growth as it relates to the body. How would you tell if somebody's physically growing in their physical body? What would be the, the indications of that? We're getting bigger. Okay, bigger, healthier, taller, taller, maybe fatter, <laughs> stronger. Yeah, I wrote some of these down. So elements are we're talking about this. What does growth look like? It means to grow, to increase in degree, to increase in size, to increase in strength. We want to see progress. We want to see development. That's what we're seeing when we see growth. That's how you would grow the, the physical body. So let's talk about spiritual growth now, growth of the body. And we're in Ephesians chapter 4 now, and we're going to go back to verse 11 now. And let's look at the explanation of growth. As you might guess, growth actually begins with leadership, right? So look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. This is he himself, that's God, God himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for, verse 12, the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, and then it goes on to talk about growth, okay? So let's digest this a little bit. The, the, the uh, growth is, is the idea of leaders equipping the saints, as it says here, for the work of ministry. It involves leadership, and it involves the saints. Now let's talk about the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the prophets are the first ones mentioned there. And let me break this down for you. What the, the, the bulk of the Old Testament was written by who? Prophets. And the bulk of the New Testament was written by? Apostles. Okay? And if you were to go over to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible says that when Jesus built his church, it says that it was built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. The Old and the New Testament. That foundation has been laid. Jesus himself, it says in Ephesians 2, 20 and 21, is the chief cornerstone. The Old and New Testament, prophets and apostles laid the foundation. Now, if you build a house, after you built the foundation, you start building the house, do you need to build another foundation? No. The foundation has been laid. So I'm saying that to say, that's why today we don't need inspired writers. We don't need inspired prophets giving us new information about God. We don't need inspired apostles today in the church giving us new information. We have the foundation laid. Old and New Testament, the Bible's complete. We have all that we need. And so that's why the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Thess or, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, all scriptures have been given by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, there's our word equipped, for every good work. We have all the equipment we need based upon the scriptures that have been written and these scriptures are profitable for us for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction and in righteousness so that then we can be equipped to do the work. Now, now we're reading about in Ephesians chapter 2 and, I'm sorry, chapter 4, in verse 12, talks about the equipping of the saints. So you had apostles and prophets, instrumental, giving us the scripture in equipping us for every good work. Then what do you have? Look again at verse uh, 11 again. Verse, yeah, verse 11. Then after apostles and prophets, you have evangelists, and then pastors and teachers. So evangelists, like myself, we preach from the written word. The word that was given to us by the prophets and the apostles. We preach from the written word, and our hope is to evangelize, that is to win souls to Christ. We have the written word, and we're trying to win souls to Christ. Uh, and we want to equip others to do that. We're part of the leadership here. Then, there's pastors and teachers. So pastors, some would say, this is one group, these are pastoring teachers. I don't, I'm not going to quibble about that, but I'll break it down just in case we talk about pastors and then teachers. So pastors, those are elders, right? Those are ones who are shepherding the flock. And we have four of them here in our congregation. They are pastoring or shepherding the flock. And then there are teachers that also play a vital role in equipping the saints. Elders shepherd the flock by example and by exhortation. And then you have teachers. And teachers function in much the same way, except they do not have a rule over the congregation as elders do. We read about in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, the elders are ruling over the congregation. 
<coughs> and so teachers equip and they function that way, but they don't rule as elders do. Unless, of course, as I said before, you want to group those together and say these are uh, 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 elders that are teachers. All right, so now let's talk about the responsibility they have. So what are these leaders now? I'll give you a hint now. You can see it in verse 12. What are they responsible for? What does it say? They're responsible to teach. What does it say in verse 12? Okay, equip and edify. Isn't that what it says? Verse 12, let me read it again here. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, and then it goes on to talk about in verse uh, uh, 12, to edify the body of Christ. So they are there to equip and to edify. And uh, they are responsible for the saints, for the work of ministry, for the growth. The work of elders is by no means an easy task. They put in a lot of time that you don't know about, and there's no pay for it. They're doing it voluntarily. And so uh, it wouldn't be wrong, by the way, to pay elders if you have elders and you decide to give them a wage from the church. The Bible talks about that in... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. There are some that make their, they, can, they earn wages from their work. And so we, we could do that if we wanted to, but most times you see congregations have elders that are not paid. But, um, and then there's the, uh, the uh, teachers, preachers and teachers. They have also a great responsibility. But if there's going to be growth, you can see so far in our text here, it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to happen because there are purposeful things done by purposed people who are leaders, who are equipping others to be purposeful in their work of ministry. We see that from the text here. It is going to be not by accident, but by the result of solid leadership. And when you have solid leadership, what leaders are hoping for is to have eager workers, saints, that are doing the work of ministry. So that's what we're seeing in the text so far. So the growth, uh, this growth, this doesn't mean that growth is only their responsibility, just the responsibility of the leaders. It's also, church, the rest of you. It's our responsibility. Those who are doing the saints, doing the work of ministry. And ministry, what is ministry? Service. That's exactly what it is. It's the word that we uh, sometimes have translated in the Bible, deacon. It's a deacon work, servant work, okay? Ministry. Ministry involves service, and not only involves service, but ministry involves soul winning as well. Just as Jesus came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19 and verse 10. Service and soul winning. Not just by coming uh, to church, and it's, it's by uh, not being just an attendee, but it's being a participant in the body. And I love members that say, I want to do more than just sit in a pew on Sunday. I want to know how I can serve, be involved in ministry. That's the ideal thing for any congregation, is for all the members to see themselves as ministers. They are doing the work of ministry. We're all in this together, not just the guy that's paid like me. So we're doing work together, serving the church, serving Christ's church. And so what is the uh, desire then for leaders is for members to say, sign me up. Those who are the saints to say, what can I do? Well, plug me in. Put me in that place of ministry. Find, help me find my talent. Help me do the work of ministry. And then it will cause the growth. Not only, watch this, not only growth in yourself, if you're coming to serve and not just sit in a pew, you get the growth of yourself. And then what happens after that? What kind of growth takes place? Church growth. Church growth. That's where we're at. Then the body grows as a whole. You have to grow first as individuals. So. That's it. Teach. Pardon me? That's it. Teach. Yes, yes. And you know what? I mean, I'm telling you, this is not some rocket science thing. I mean, in terms of you saying, I want to be more than a person that sits in the pew. We have all kinds of things that can be done. I mean, something as small as sharpening the pencils in the pews where they fill out their guest card. Something uh, as small as uh, saying, hey, maybe I can come sit at the front door when people come in and be a greeter. You know, whatever it is, just be a smiler. Whatever it is, what can I do? What area of service can I be involved in? All right, so let me see. Where do I want to go next? So this all then relates to the next aspect then of growth. 
And that is the idea of edifying the body. You see it on your outline, point number one, letter B. Edifying the body. The work of ministry is centered around evangelism. We want to get people to heaven. Don't be thrown off when I say that word evangelism. We're just talking about the goal of when this life is done, get to spend eternity with God. That's what evangelism is. But it includes the body. And edification relates exclusively to the body. When I say that, I want to show you a verse now. Hold your place in Ephesians here. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, I'm going to jump in and out of the text right here that's going to seem kind of a little awkward for us because in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the, uh, the context there is Paul speaking to a, a church that was speaking in tongues, which the Bible says that that has ceased today. We're not speaking in tongues in the church, but they had that was one of the things that they did. So when he's talking to them, he's going to talk about that as well as things that they can do with and for the church. But I want you to see this in Luke, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look at verse 26. And he's talking about when they come together to worship. In verse 26 he says, How is it then, when you come together, that each of you has a song? David had one tonight. Let us in a song, right, or two. Has a song. You have a teaching. You have a tongue. See, they're speaking in tongues. They have a revelation. That might be the revelation of that tongue or interpretation of the tongue. He says, you've got all these things. You're coming together. What does he say at the end of verse 26? He says, when you're doing that, let all things be done for edification. So you got a preacher up here that can get up and say things. i got a better talent than all of you. Look what I could do. I could teach a class. Then I get a big head about it. I look like I'm showing off because I'm spouting off Greek words and I'm showing you how smart I am and, and all that. And Does that bring edification to the body? Well, it might a little bit, but it sort of brings edification to me. So what we got to do is make sure that we don't step into the lion light, into the spotlight, look like we're somebody special, but we're just one of the servants. Whatever we can do, we can edify somebody just by saying a kind word, getting up to preach a sermon, lead a song, do a prayer, scripture reading, whatever it is. He says, here, let it all be done for edification. And so I, I, I tell you what, when I, when I think about edification, do you think today that we ever get enough edification in the church today? No. Not at all. We have all the room in the world to grow in this area where we can pray for the sick, we can vis visit widows and orphans, and we can encourage a weak brother or a weak sister. We need a lot of edification in the body. All right, I'm just realizing as I look at the time that I need to really motor here. Okay, so reaching the loss, building up the body, that cannot be done effectively unless... We as individuals are maturing in Christ. I want you to go back with me now to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's see again the significance of spiritual maturity. We ended in verse 12 by edifying the body, and then what does he say? Here's another goal of the church. Look at verse 13. Here's the goal. So then we all come, we want to get to that goal, come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, this is what we're after, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 14, so that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. That's a lot of mouth, that's a mouthful there. But the idea, look at verse 15, is that when we've done all that, that we're speaking the truth in love and that we're growing up into our head who is Christ. So this growth, this is growth right here when you think about it. This is maturity, spiritual growth. And if we don't have numerical growth, it is usually because we don't have spiritual growth. He's saying we need to get our, our heads on straight as individuals, see that we're here together, working together, but also working together to individually, first of all, help ourselves grow up into our head, be fully mature in Christ, that's what we're after, and then the body can grow as well. And so the level of our maturity determines the degree of our growth. All right, back over points one and two, or just point one real quickly. We're talking about edifying the body, uh, equipping the saints, and then uh, we talked about establishing maturity. Now let's go to point number two, evidences of growth. What are the evidences of physical growth? Well, evidences of physical growth is a child's hungry. They want to eat. Their body then goes through the proper stages of development. That, we talked about that earlier. So look at uh, your point number two, letter A. Here's something that we need more and more in the church today. And we need Christians who have a passion for God. 
That is their ultimate goal. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We need a passion. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, what did He say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Remember, we're not talking about filling the pews. We're talking about filling people with a passion for righteousness, that we want God more than anything to be present in our lives. We have to have a desire for righteousness, initially and continually as well. And you can see that in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's talk about a second thing here. It says on your outline, point number 2, letter B, we need to have a progression in our faith, our hope, and our love. Let's turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. You see the plaque on the wall? Where did it go? Oh, it's right there. See the middle column here? It says faith, hope, and love. I'm glad it was put there because that's what I want to talk about now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning of verse 3. Paul says, regarding the church at Thessalonica, he says, now we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as the Thessalonians, right? He says, as it is fitting, why is it fitting, Paul? Because your faith, watch this, grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience, that's hope, and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations which you endure. Verse 3, your faith grows. He says, I can see love. I can see patience. I can see hope. Patience, that's what patience is. Look over in the first letter that he wrote to them. 1 Thessalonians now. Just a few pages over. Watch this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. says a very similar thing here, writing to this church at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 2, Paul says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of what? Faith. Your labor of what? Love. And your patience of what? Oh, Faith, hope, and love. Church, you as individuals, grow in your faith. Grow in your love for each other, your families, your neighbors, your enemies. Grow in your love. Grow in your faith. And grow in your hope. Have a hope that is unshakable. You hope in God so much that nothing else gets in the way. We've got to grow in those areas. And so... Just wanted to bring that out. Now let's go over to, uh, back over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now once again, along with maturity, we need ministry. Ministry is a third evidence. Who are the mature and growing Christians here in this congregation? It's usually the ones, the first ones who will step up like Isaiah the prophet did and say, Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me. Put me in a place of service. Put me in a place of ministry. And we saw that again in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. We're about the work of ministry. Participating. Participation in the body is also an evidence of growth. Do you have today, church member today, do you have, Christian, do you have today a talent that you're not using for the Lord Go to the elders and say, I don't know where I can get plugged in. I've got this thing that I can do. I'm pretty good at this, woodworking or whatever it is. Hey, can I do something for the church? I'm sure the elders will say, yeah, we'll put you to work. Ministry, the work of ministry. Finally, point number three on your outline. i got to do this quick. Talk about elements of growth. So on elements of growth, you see the Word of God. The Word of God is what causes growth. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, I think it is, it says that we as newborn babes, we desire the pure milk of the Word. We want the Word. We desire it. We crave it. And when we have that Word, the Word is going to bring about growth. Uh, which at the time, you can write the scripture reference down later on next to this point on the Word of God. And that is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. I see some taking notes tonight. That's, I'm seeing some growth right there. Thank you, Kay. Being a good example. So, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14 says that he wants that Paul, or writer of Hebrews said, I want you to mature in your faith, and I want you to, to, to get off of the mill and get into the meat of the world. You, word. He says, I want you to be skilled in righteousness by absorbing the word. We need the word in our lives. Point number three on your outline, letter B. 
And this is what we're doing on Sunday mornings. What are we doing? We are worshiping God. And we grow through worship. We grow through the experience of singing songs of praise, of communing with the Lord on the table, taking the communion. In our worship, we are growing. You know, people think today that church is an option. I'll tell you something today. Church is an option, but it's only an option for those who don't want to grow. It's only an option for those who don't want to grow and will eventually die because of that. You want church as an option? Maybe you want your spiritual death as an option as well. Worship to God. All right, now letter C on your outline. Point number three, letter C. How about the worries of life? You probably scratched your head on that one. I put that on the outline, right? Wait a minute. How do worries in our lives cause growth? Well, read James chapter 1. You guys have a class on that. I think, uh, uh, um, Drew, you taught a class in James, right? In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, says there that... Uh, that uh, our, our, when we have trials in life, that it develops character within us. It builds character within us. And so, yeah, worries in life, that'll cause you to grow. That'll cause you to, to, to look more to God and not things that you, resources that you have because you are placing your faith in God. Wish I had more time to talk about that in James chapter 1. But anyway, um, last one on your outline, and this is what we've been talking about the whole class, is you want to grow, it's going to happen by what? Let's just say on letter D, point number three, work, 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 work. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. And I'll tell you why it's never in vain. When you're steadfast, when you won't be moved by the worries or other concerns or backbiting of other Christians because they think you're not doing enough work, and if you're doing the work of the Lord, the reason why you need to keep doing it and it's never in vain is because it causes growth. That's why it's never in vain. Every work that you do for the Lord is bringing you up to your level of growth. You're growing into yourself, in the, up into your head, who is Christ, as an individual, and then it's going to ooze out to the body of Christ as well. It's through our work in the Lord. There's a spiritual reward for our physical labor in the Lord. Did you know that? I want you to turn with me quickly to Galatians chapter 6. It's pretty close to where we're at right now in Ephesians. Galatians chapter 6, read with me now in Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. This is uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. The Bible says... Do not be deceived, and the world's going to try to deceive you to say this isn't true, okay? So he says, don't be deceived, verse 7. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. People think today, oh, I can do whatever I want, get away with it, there's no consequences. No, he says, there will be a reaping. In verse 4, 8, he says, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. In verse 9, then, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. He is not losing heart. Knowing our labor in the Lord is never in vain. We work the physical things that we do for the Lord, have a reward from the Lord. Our work is not in vain, and the reason is, is because, let's go back over to Ephesians chapter 4 now, and verse 16, what happens is it causes the growth of the body. Verse 16. Verse 16 says the whole body is joined together, knit together, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Why does it cause the growth of the body? Because the body, body growth means saved souls. That's what we're after. That's the goal. We have body growth. We sometimes will have numerical growth as a result of that, as resulting in the salvation of souls. And that's the that's the you know that's the goal of the body. The Bible says in uh, Ephesians chapter five and verse twenty three that Jesus is the Savior of the body. The body is all about people getting saved. Jesus is the Savior of the body. We are working, we're growing, we're maturing, we're worshiping, we're working together. We have leaders doing what they would do to encourage us and edify us. And we're doing the work of ministry. 
And all of it is going to result one day in us sitting up in the lap of our Father in heaven, enjoying eternity because we chose to grow His body here on earth so we can have eternity with God. Look at the question on the uh, bottom of your outline, conclusion. Are you doing your share to cause the growth of the body? I thought I'd lay a little guilt trip on you as we close tonight. Sorry that it wasn't more discussion because I, I, I didn't plan my material right. I, got, I ran out of time. But uh, hopefully this must have been meaningful and uh, hopefully stimulate your thoughts on, you know, what can I do as an individual to make it all happen together collectively in terms of church growth. All right, so uh, we're going to, let's see, I think I'll take maybe two minutes of uh, any kind of questions or discussion you might have, and then we'll assemble our prayer list and we'll do with a prayer tonight.